Today on Angel's Den, six teams of St. Michael's Hospital's all-star scientists and doctors lay it all on the line as they compete to win funding for their game-changing research ideas. The stakes are always high here on Angel's Den. Everything is so important. Data is important. The vaccines are important. we got to find a way to fund them all. These are our heroes and our frontline workers, but to actually see how fast they're moving to solutions is like incredibly inspiring. We're pulling back the curtain to show you tomorrow's most exciting medical breakthroughs only on Angel's Den. Brought to you by St. Michael's Hospital Foundation with presenting sponsor, RBC. Now, please welcome our Angel's Den host, one of Toronto's most recognizable voices, CHFI radio personality, Maureen Holloway. Welcome everyone. We're coming to you from the beautiful Kerner Hall with the sixth annual Angel's Den. Now this is Canada's hottest medical research competition. So brace yourselves. You're going to witness medical history in the making as teams of bold scientists compete for a staggering $450,000 in funding. And they are giving us hope when we need it the most. To tell you more about what's at stake, please welcome the president and CEO of Unity Health, Dr. Tim Rutledge. Hi, I'm Tim Rutledge. Medical research saves and extends lives. One of the biggest roadblocks is lack of funding. The Angel's Den formula is unconventional. It was created to cut through the red tape and fund ideas that traditional roots might not be ready for. Angel's Den invests in early stage and highly promising research, which then attracts more funding, more talent, and more support. It's a ripple effect that delivers results. The science you'll see in this competition is big, it's bold, it's the work of sleepless nights of St. Michael's best and brightest. And it is transformative for our doctors, our scientists, and most importantly, for our patients. As you'll see ahead, we stop at nothing to tackle the world's toughest health challenges. So, who decides who gets the big money to realize their medical dream? Well, both our panel of jurors and our judges will cast their votes to determine who wins. We have over 40, actually I think we may have over 50 remarkable jurors who are steadfast supporters of science joining us via Zoom. Thank you and welcome everyone. And we have our three celebrity judges. Please welcome retail fashion and business pioneer, Joe Mimran, who's never met a bolt of cashmere he doesn't want to roll around in. <laughs> Tech titan, Michelle Romanow. And film producer and content creator, Vinay Vermani. With the current state of the world right now, Angel's Den and funding medical research feels more important than ever. So here's how it's all gonna play out. Each of our six teams from St. Michael's Hospital will have only four minutes to pitch their unique research projects. They're split into two categories, which are brand new this year, COVID-19 research and innovative health research. The judges and jury will award two prizes of $150,000 each to the top team in each category. Now, teams who do not claim a prize will still get $25,000 to support their research, so no one walks away empty-handed. An audience, you will have a chance to participate as well you can vote for your favorite team to win the $50,000 People's Choice Award, which is presented by Canada Life. We're gonna open up voting after all six teams have presented. Voting will be done electronically, and I'll explain how that works at the end of the program. Now, let's hear from Dr. Ori Rothstein, St. Michael's Vice President of Research and Innovation about the first prize. Even though COVID-19 has taken over our lives, other chronic diseases haven't let up and neither do St. Michael's scientists. They're charging ahead with groundbreaking research and cutting edge technology in areas like mental health, pressure wounds, and intensive care recovery. And thanks to the Odette Innovative Health Award, they've got a chance to make their research happen. Here are the three teams competing for the Odette Innovative Health Award. Dr. Jane Batt, Drs. Karim Lada and Sydney Kennedy. Dr. Karen Cross, as we meet these remarkable scientists, we're going to give you a behind-the-scenes look before their pitch. Our six team biographies are brought to you by Deloitte. Up now is a scientist who wants to make sure our muscles don't waste away. My name's Dr. Jane Batt. I'm a respirologist here at St. Michael's and a physician scientist. I was born in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. There was a family tragedy. I lost my parents when I was young. They were killed in a plane crash, and I went to live with an uncle. He was a fighter pilot. So I appreciate every day. You never know if this day is gonna be your last, which is probably why I go full steam ahead all the time. 
and probably why I enjoy and challenge. When I grew up, I wanted to be an astronaut. It was exciting. You could go someplace where no one had ever gone, you know, just like Star Trek. The life of a medical researcher is a tough life, but it's incredibly rewarding. I look at things every day that no one else has ever looked at. I'm doing things that are completely novel. I'm, I'm trying to answer questions that, that no one has an answer for. That's what drew me to medicine. It was very similar to wanting to be an astronaut. St. Michael's caters to individuals who are marginalized and vulnerable. And I've always felt that that was the population that I wanted to work with. My research focuses on trying to understand why chronic muscle wasting occurs. This happens in many people with chronic illness as well as in the intensive care unit. These people often will never regain proper muscle function, which means they require help feeding, they require help walking, they require help bathing. We're developing a uh, smart garment that we would put on critically ill people to stimulate their muscle, to keep it working so that it doesn't lose mass or strength while they're ill. There was an episode of Star Trek where McCoy uses smart garments. I think that perhaps my garments might be as good as Dr. McCoy's. My kids are talking about buying me space camp. Did you know as an adult you can go to space camp? And that's going to be my retirement send-off, space camp. Her full steam ahead approach to life has made her a finalist. Please welcome Dr. Jane Batt. Good evening. This is Dan. He's one of 250,000 Canadians admitted to an intensive care unit last year. Now, Dan survived his critical illness after two weeks on a ventilator and the fight of his life. His ecstatic family took him home, very much looking forward to Dan returning to a normal life. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. While we have made huge advances over the past two to three decades with medical care that have increased the likelihood of surviving a critical illness, they have also inadvertently created a syndrome known as ICU-acquired weakness and to which Dan succumbed. Now, up to half of the people in our ICUs today will develop muscle wasting and weakness that is significant, and this may last a lifetime. This is a CAT scan of a leg, a healthy leg. The bone is white. All of this gray is muscle. This is Dan's leg. Six months after discharge from the ICU, there's no muscle. And because of this, he can barely walk without an aid. Increasing age and duration of ICU stay put us at risk. We know if we're over 66 and we've been in the ICU ventilator for more than a week, we may have a 50-50 chance of never being able to bathe or dress or feed ourselves independently ever again. Now, we don't completely understand the biology that, that uh, underpins ICU-acquired weakness, but we do know that a huge contributing factor is the complete inactivity that happens in the unit. It's that old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it, and our muscles literally melt away. So to try and prevent this, we walk people on breathing machines, we cycle them in bed, we stimulate their muscles with electrical stimulation to try and get them to contract. And if we can do any one of these things every day, muscles will be better. Problem is we can't. This is incredibly resource intensive therapy from a staffing standpoint. Moreover, not everybody is stable enough or awake enough to be able to take part. So what we need is an automated therapy suitable for everyone that can be applied by one or two therapists to all patients in the ICU. And our team is creating that therapy. Our solution are smart textile garments that will self-regulate to exercise the muscle. We're gonna be making arm sleeves and leg stockings. The leg stocking, for example, will wrap around the leg. It's formed of a soft conductive fabric that can actually transmit electrical signals. So we have multiple conduction points within the garment that will stimulate the muscles to contract and then embedded sensors will pick up the electrical signal of that contraction. Now, there are conductive fabrics that are commercially available and we're scoping options. Our innovation is to use machine learning techniques to develop garments that will drive themselves. So we're developing custom software and hardware so that we can actually program the garment to optimally find the best motor points for stimulation and then self-regulate that stimulation based on the feedback that the garment receives from the sensors. So basically we're building a garment that is able to auto-regulate and deliver the exercise that we want the muscle to have. 
We're also building um, software so that each garment will be individually controlled. And then so that we can, we're putting software together so that we can monitor and simultaneously manage all patients through a dashboard display by a single therapist. So now instead of one therapist just working on one muscle and one patient at a time, one therapist can deliver sustainable therapy to all four limbs and everybody in the ICU. We have the team necessary for success. We cover all aspects of biomedical, clinical, engineering, and computer science expertise that's required. We are currently building a prototype. We're working with Kite, H2I, uh, working through networking to try and build some industry uh, partnerships. We need Angel's Den funding to help us complete and scale up our prototype development, allow us to file for IP protection, and to help us obtain regulatory uh, strategy guidance through the appropriate consultants. We want to stop ICU-acquired weakness. We want to ensure that when Dan and others like him go home, they go home to a full and active life. We have the team, we have the idea, we just need your support. Thanks very much. Wow. wow. That's amazing. If, if you can do all that for $150,000, you're gonna come work with me. That's incredible. I mean, to get all the IP done and to get all of the sampling done. Well, we're working, so we have secured some funding. Uh, through the National Frontiers and Research Fund. It's uh, for high-risk, high-impact projects. Uh, so we got some money from them. That's how we're, we're um, starting with our prototype development. Um, I have uh, engineers, computer scientists on our, our team. We've excited a lot of grad students. Is, is this something that only can be used in like a hospital or is there a version of this that a patient can take home with them and their family members can control it based on the settings and things like that? This can be applied to all sorts of diseases. So for example, if you are somebody who has a, a chronic illness and, and uh, you, you can't get out of bed and you need some stimulation, the idea, yes, is that we wouldn't use exactly the same thing we'd use in the intensive care unit, but we could use a similar setup. What's different about our product is that we're getting these to self-regulate, they're gonna deliver the amount of work the muscle needs based on the feedback that we're gonna be receiving from biosensors. Mm. And we're not just gonna use you know, surface EMG. This will allow us to work in the unit, but depending on how we change it, it could be duplicable to any disease where we have wasting. It's a great, great uh, work you're doing. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. I, Thank you. I, uh, I, Thank want, you. The, I want the six pack version, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank Fantastic. you so much. Thank you. Amazing. An anesthesiologist and a psychiatrist walk into a bar. Could be the start of a bad joke, but instead it's resulted in a novel way to treat depression. Take a look. My name is Dr. Kareem Lada, and I'm a staff anesthesiologist at St. Michael's Hospital, an associate scientist at the Lee Cushing Knowledge Institute. I'm Dr. Sid Kennedy. I'm a staff psychiatrist and I'm the uh, director of the Center for Depression and Suicide Studies at St. Michael's Hospital and a scientist at Lee Kaohsiung. His is a lot longer than mine. That's because I've been around a lot longer than you. Couple years. Once I got over the idea of being a footballer and playing for my favorite team, <laughs> Tottenham Hotspur, I ended up about age 15 saying I would like to do psychiatry. It happened much later for me. I think I was almost done college that I decided that I was going to leave economics behind and embark on med school. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. I think most of the time, if I'm not here, I'm, I'm running around with the kids. I think there's a lot of different ways to unwind and I actually enjoy lots of pasta and sometimes with very heavy sauces. That, that's a pretty boring guilty pleasure, I know, Sid. I know. <laughs> so how did we meet and what was the common ground? I think the short answer would be novel treatments for depression. When I'm talking to Sid about my patients, I say, hey, I don't know how to treat their depression. And the thing he says to me is, well, I don't know how to treat my patient's pain. It really started from that. I think we're in a unique position to really change how we look at some of the treatments. You know, having mentors like Sid who have been there before, that's what keeps me going. The fact that an anesthesiologist and a psychiatrist can come together and come up with something innovative and different, I think that really, to me, exemplifies the St. Michael spirit. Please welcome Drs. Kareem Lada and Sid Kennedy.
Sarah is my patient. She's 38 years old. And for the past year, she would give anything to have two or three days when she's not depressed. She's not torn apart by lack of sleep. Nothing is enjoyable in her life. She has major depression. And unfortunately, she's one of 1.8 million Canadians in a year who experience major depression. And if you want a context, that's actually more people than live in the provinces of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Here in the COVID era, we actually believe these figures could be even higher. We know that uh, anxiety has increased fourfold in the COVID compared to pre-COVID era, and depression is about two and a half times more. Now we do have treatments. We have medication treatments, we have talk therapies, we have neurostimulation treatments, and they work, but they take time. And unfortunately, they don't work for everyone. So my colleague has some thoughts about alternatives. So it may seem strange to some people that an anesthesiologist and a psychiatrist would be on stage together. But we actually have a lot more in common than you might think. So what we now know is that the same receptors in areas of the brain that we use in anesthesia to alter consciousness and treat pain are the same ones that psychiatrists use to treat depression. That means that anesthetic drugs represent an exciting new class of medications in the fight against depression. So rather than taking drugs from scratch, which can cost billions of dollars and decades to develop, what we want to do is repurpose existing compounds. We want a drug that's safe, widely available, inexpensive, and rapidly acting. But we think we have the perfect candidate drug, and that is nitrous oxide, otherwise known more commonly as laughing gas. Now, laughing gas or nitrous oxide is one of the most common anesthetic gases available today. In fact, many of you watching might have had it during a dental procedure or a surgical operation. It's available in clinics and hospitals across Canada. It's not on patent. And importantly, we don't think this is gonna work simply because it makes you laugh. Although that doesn't hurt, we know that nitrous oxide works on a particular receptor in the brain that has been shown time and time again to improve symptoms of depression. But before we can roll this out in prime time, we need to generate rigorous scientific evidence in order to demonstrate its efficacy. So what we want to do is conduct a randomized controlled trial of 40 patients with treatment-resistant depression. That means that they've already failed conventional therapies. We're going to randomize them to either getting nitrous oxide or a placebo drug and give them treatments once a week for three weeks. We're going to measure their outcomes that matter to patients both in the short and long term to see how long the effect of the gas lasts. So for $150,000, what we want to do is establish nitrous oxide as a new therapy for depression. So for Sarah, and the thousands of Canadians who are currently suffering like her. What we want to do is give a drug that is already available at St. Michael's Hospital, that we know to be safe and has already been given to millions of patients, and give Sarah the chance to get her life back. What we want you to do is help us take Sarah and the millions of Canadians who are currently suffering like her to give them the chance to laugh again. Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic. Wow. What a cool project! Like to to you, like the creativity around like if this is the same part of the brain and to use something that's already based. So maybe explain to like a layperson like me, you know, this is kind of the amount of laughing gas you'd give to a, a dental patient versus like if you were using this as treatment. Like how would a person feel? Like that kind of stuff. Yeah, so um, when we give it even at low doses, people will feel a little woozy. Yeah. It's not going to actually make anybody laugh. Uh, yeah. I think that doesn't really happen. If you think about a dentist's office, no. if the patient's no laughing, laughing at the dentist. <laughs> um, but it will make patients feel woozy. So that's why in our placebo arm, we will be giving a sedative that will mimic that woozy feeling so patients won't know what they're actually getting. Oh, cool. Can you combine this treatment with other drugs? Like, do we know if that can cause any reactions? Yeah, so, uh, you know, one of the things about uh, psychiatry, and Sid can speak more to this, is a lot of the antidepressants that we have today take weeks to work. And oftentimes we have to wait weeks to figure out, does this drug work? And if it doesn't, then we have to try another one. The benefit of something like nitrous oxide is it works rapidly. And so we could get almost instant feedback and actually come up with a bridge for those two weeks while other drugs are working. But it's a simple, it's a simple process, yes, right? Yes, and it's also... I could come in, be, I could be really depressed, and you could say, why don't you just 
put this on, see how I, you feel. I think that's a good point. It, it's sort of almost deceptively simple, right? but yet psychiatrists and anesthetists rarely sit down and come up with a, a common uh, goal. So I think this is a good example of the synergy. It's fantastic. It's really it's cool. And I love just it. An enormous amount of people. It's, a, it's such a cool project. Thank I love you guys. It. Did, did you I bring like a tank <laughs> for us today to, to talk to me after the show? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Up now is a leading Canadian expert who has a way to intervene before injury pressure builds. Take a look. My name is Dr. Karen Cross. I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon here at St. Michael's Hospital and also a surgeon scientist. I grew up in Newfoundland. I love to read, so if you wanted to find me, I was either in a library or somewhere hidden reading a book. When I was a child, I wanted to be a doctor. I actually went to school in grade two dressed as a physician, and they said, girls, they don't become doctors. So in that moment, I realized that I was going to show that teacher what I could do and that I was determined uh, in the end to become a physician, and no matter how hard or, or what the battle was gonna be moving forward. You probably wouldn't believe me if I told you what I like to do in my free time, but I am an amateur surfer, and I've been all over the world surfing lots of different types of waves, and I like to do this with my little baby son. That's what we like to do as a family. What brought me to St. Michael's, I believe, is the mission of the hospital. We treat the most vulnerable patients, and we give them a voice. My project is skin imaging for pressure injuries. Pressure injuries are a uniquely Canadian problem. It's an epidemic in this country. So if someone's lying in bed for a long period of time, they end up with erosions through their skin. These erosions actually extend from the skin down through their muscle and to their bone. These are life-threatening injuries, so they can end up with infections and they can also succumb or die from these injuries. So my grandfather had a wound in his leg, so he had a diabetic a foot ulcer. Here I'm one of the leading experts in this country, yet I couldn't help my own grandfather who was in a rural part of Newfoundland. I can't tell you what that journey did to our family personally, but I know that there's more than just my family out there. What I'm doing both in my clinical work and research, it's about speaking for the most vulnerable people. And I can tell you, I will not stop until we solve the problem. Amateur surfer and an expert scientist, please welcome Dr. Karen Cross. Debbie is a middle-aged woman who's in the ICU battling COVID. She's on her stomach so she can breathe. Michael is a young man who had surgery. He needs a protracted stay in the hospital after he's had, had this surgical procedure. Lila is our lovely elderly patient who had a bladder infection needing IV antibiotics and also needing a hospital admission. What do all of these patients have in common? They had a bed sore, which is also known as a pressure injury in the medical environment. Anyone in the hospital is at risk for a pressure injury. These are erosions, as we've said, through their flesh, muscle, bone. It can lead to infection, sepsis, and death. But what you might not understand is sometimes these holes are the size of my head at times, I've been able to put my entire arm up someone's back. They're painful, they're debilitating, and it's the most horrific and horrendous way that you can die. The other most surprising piece to this are these are never events. They are never supposed to happen. Never, but yet they happen. This is a Canadian problem. We are really good at making bed sores. We, in the developed world, we are the number one country in terms of the volume of patients that have these injuries. One in four families are suffering with a pressure injury. We have a 26% prevalence rate, which is about 10 million people and the equivalent to the population of the five major cities in Canada, so 10 million people. We're spending $5.9 billion Canadian a year to treat the problem. As a healthcare provider and expert in the space, all that I really have are my eyes, and also, they've lovely given me this paper ruler. This is all I have to treat my patients. How can I see 10 million people in this country with my own eyes and just a paper ruler? It's impossible. And I have to see them every 12 hours to assess their risk. It's just never gonna happen. 
This is where we came up with a solution called SKIP. So SKIP stands for Skin Imaging for Pressure Injuries. And I actually have the prototype here in my hands. I'm just gonna reach down and grab it. This is uh, essentially a proprietary camera and an LED ring. The LED ring actually uses visible near-infrared and infrared light looking below the surface of the skin at novel biomarkers that are predictive of tissue health. We actually interface with a smartphone. It has an app. It's as simple as taking a selfie or a picture. And in 750 milliseconds, we can risk profile the patient and tell the person at the bedside what is the risk profile of the patient. Not only that, that's putting my expert eyes at the bedside where perhaps there's a non-expert doing that assessment. The second thing that we also can do is pop up those best practice guidelines or treatment recommendations so that that non-expert knows what they need to do in terms of those next steps. So in 750 milliseconds, we can see almost everybody in this whole country. We are uniquely positioned as a team to be successful in bringing this to market. We have a technology team comprised of both software and hardware engineers. We have a business team that has commercialized devices before as well as has regulatory experience. But what you may not know at St. Michael's Hospital is we have the largest and most innovative wound care team in this country. In fact, it's a world class and people come from all over the country for an opinion from our team. We have academic collaborators who are gonna help us with individual pieces of the technology, but mainly around the user experience and how people uh, experience the results, I suppose. Finally, we are already on a trajectory for success. As I've shown you, we have our first prototype, and this has been tested both in the lab and as well in normal healthy patients. We want to put these into clinical trials in the fall of this year. In 18 months, we will be set up then for regulatory clearance with early commercialization in 2022. The impact of $150,000 is actually gonna take us a long way. We can put essentially these uh, devices into trials as early as October, Manufacturing clearly would be a top priority for the device, and well, it gets us to our early milestone of commercialization. Overall, to highlight again, anyone can get a pressure injury. We are all at risk. We can change this with Skip. What would you prefer, the paper ruler in my pocket or the technology in the box? I think the answer is pretty simple, and you can change that. Thank you very much. That's, that's great. Awesome. Really cool project. So why is this such an epidemic in Canada? Like, isn't, aren't you at the same risk because you're lying in a hospital bed? Or like, what is it about Canadians that this is we're more prone to this? Yeah, um, the first thing is that we don't do skin risk profiling very well. And we have a lot of non-experts at the bedside. So it's the first problem we have. We have good treatment methods and we are able to implement them. The second thing is we don't have those recommendations also at the bedside. So it's sort of two things. But it still doesn't an really answer the question of why in Canada do we have more than other countries? Well, if you don't have a diagnosis, you're not putting, implementing your and, treatment. And is that the only reason? I, wouldn't you think that some other countries would also be weak on the diagnosis side? Surprisingly, you would think, like just generally people think the United States, you know, sometimes is always worse in this area than us. But because of um, legal action, I suppose, yeah. they've been more aggressive about implementing more skin risk assessment profiles and more regularly. Wow. Wow. It really is down to what we're doing here in Canada is you've asked me to fight a forest fire with a garden hose. Like I, I've, got, I've got no technology to help me. It's great work. Great work. Fantastic. And I love your story. Your personal story is a great one. Thank you so they much. They told you you couldn't be a doctor. You showed them, didn't you? Thank yeah. you so, Thank you so much. much. Thanks for the opportunity. The judges and jurors will be making their choice and we'll find out the winner of the Odette Innovative Health Award at the end of the program. Before we move on to the next category, we want to thank the many sponsors and donors who make Angel's Den possible. We can't thank you enough for your generous support. Remember to vote for the People's Choice Award. Voting will only be open from 8 to 9 p.m. Our next three teams are competing for the Keenan COVID-19 Research Award. Once again, let's hear from Dr. Rothstein about this award. 
It's not surprising that we created an award just to deal with COVID-19. It's upended all of our lives. Right now, St. Michael scientists are working on over 60 research projects dealing with every aspect of COVID-19. They're working on new vaccines and treatments, pandemic tracking systems, ventilation methods, and PPE technology. And they're figuring out how to care for our very most vulnerable populations. Together with our frontline workers, who we owe our deepest thanks, our scientists are bringing the hope and help our patients deserve. Here are the three teams competing for the Keenan COVID-19 Research Award. Drs. Amal Verma and Fahad Razak. Dr. Mario Ostrowski. Drs. Darren Yuen and Kieran McIntyre. These personal stories are giving us real insights into these incredible minds. The superstar finalist team wants to use big data to develop the best way hospitals can care for patients with COVID-19. My name is Dr. Amol Verma. I'm a clinician scientist uh, at St. Michael's Hospital. I work in internal medicine, caring for patients who are hospitalized. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Fahad Razak. I'm an internal medicine physician as well. So we do general medical care, including the care of COVID patients. Growing up, the first thing I wanted to be was a garbage truck driver, because it looked very fun to hang off the back of the truck. When I was growing up, my dad was an engineer, and, and I wanted to be an engineer, and actually, I went into engineering before I went into medicine. So we actually met in the first week of medical school. I think we were in the same orientation group. I was definitely more popular. <laughs> he was definitely some, older. Some things don't change, that's right. I'm still older. I was fortunate to receive a Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford, and I studied economic and history and how healthcare is delivered in conflict zones. And really, it was my first exposure to using big data sets to answer really focused questions. So the research training that I did before I joined St. Michael's was at the Harvard Center for Population and Development. The methods and the insights I learned have really translated to the work I do now. My favorite way to unwind at the end of the day is to watch the uh, Toronto Raptors win an NBA championship. After I leave hospital, we have two young toddlers, so the next many hours of my life is involved with the joy of caring for them. Um, he just made me look like a terrible father. <laughs> When I joined St. Michael's as a staff physician, one of the things that was really striking is, although we were all very philosophically interested in improving quality of care, there is very little data to support that. How can we improve something if we don't know what to improve? Every day in healthcare, we generate billions of pieces of information. And our project really is about using that data to improve the care of COVID patients, but also all the other patients affected by the COVID pandemic. We have a unique opportunity to generate evidence about how best to care for COVID patients in the same way that diseases are contagious, science can also be contagious. And we're hoping that our results, our impact, has relevance for the whole world. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Amal Verma and Dr. Fahad Razak. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so good evening. Uh, we're excited to tell you about digital tools we're building to help prepare hospitals for a second wave of COVID. So you've all heard of the 1918 Spanish influenza. This was the single most lethal event in human history. More than 50 million individuals died. And scientists like ourselves are now looking back to 1918 to see what lessons we can learn. So what do things look like in Ontario right now? So this is the mortality curve for Ontario. And we've managed to weather the first wave. And fortunately, less than 3,000 people died in Ontario during this. But what you may not know is behind the scenes in the healthcare system, it was chaos. We had to reimagine or reinvent nearly every element of how we care for patients. For example, a simple task like moving a patient through the hallway of a hospital became enormously complicated because of the infection risk. We had very little evidence to tell us what to do. So looking more closely at 1918, a really striking fact is the majority of deaths occurred in the second wave, not in the first wave. And if you look at Ontario's data, it superimposes really closely on that first wave, and the implications for us is terrifying if that is true. You may wonder why this occurred. It's because the health system was overwhelmed in the second wave. So even basic therapies like delivering oxygen became very difficult. We are simply not ready for a second wave. Even before COVID, our hospitals were already over capacity. You've all heard of things like hallway healthcare. Predicting the need for crucial and scarce resources is extremely challenging, and hospitals currently don't know how many masks or ventilators they may require. And finally, COVID-19 is a mysterious illness. Let me give you one striking fact. 
the best available tests we have today in Canada, what we use in Ontario, the nasal swab, misses one out of every three patients who have COVID. So Fahad told you three pretty stra staggering challenges we face. We believe that data and analytics can be an essential part of the solution to preparing us for the next wave of COVID-19. For the last five years, Fahad and I have been building Canada's largest hospital data platform at St. Michael's Hospital called Gemini. We are working with 30 hospitals across Ontario who care for 70% of the province's patients to collect data. Every day, billions of data points are generated in healthcare when a doctor measures a blood pressure or when they prescribe a medication, right? But before Gemini, that data was not available for collection and analysis for research. We have harnessed that data into a unique platform. We make it available to more than 100 scientists and students to do leading groundbreaking research, including artificial intelligence powered analytics. With your help, we can use Gemini to fight COVID-19. For science and research to have impact, we need to translate those findings to the bedside. With your investment of $150,000, we will hire software developers to take the algorithms that our artificial intelligence scientists create and turn them into tools, into mobile applications or web-based applications that doctors and decision makers at the bedside can use to improve the way we use hospital capacity, to improve the allocation of scarce resources, for example, by predicting how many ventilators or masks a hospital will need, and by shedding light on this mysterious illness of COVID-19. This figure is, is scary. We've weathered the first storm, but we don't need to relive the horrible history of 1918. We can use data and analytics to be better prepared for the next wave so that we can write a new story, so that we can deliver a brighter future beyond COVID-19. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay. So I've spent a lot of time in AI as well. And the, one of the, I mean, the jokes is it's not even about machine learning, it's about data cleaning, the first part. And so in six months, will you actually have enough time to clean this data in a way that you can get real insights out of it? Yeah, thanks. It's a really good, good question from someone who knows what they're asking about. Um, I, We've spent five years figuring out how to use this data and collect this data and make it usable, standardized across sites. And so, yeah, we think we will be ready, fortunately, because we're building on work we've been doing for a really long time. If we were starting from scratch, I would say no way. But we've been spending five years trying to figure out methods to automate data cleaning and make it a, a usable, research-ready database. Can you do it in time? I mean, COVID is here. You're only going to get $150,000. Yeah, so if we only had $150,000, I think the answer would be no. But fortunately, we actually have the funding to build the database and to do the science. What we don't have the funding for is the software development to take that science and turn it into tools to affect clinical decisions. Thank That's you. That's great. Nice. Thank you so much. Up now is a pitch for a COVID-19 vaccine, yes, with a one-two punch. My name is Mario Ostrowski. I'm a clinician scientist at uh, St. Michael's Hospital, Unity Health. I'm a professor of medicine and I do research on immunology of infectious diseases. When I was a child, I was just interested in learning. I was fascinated with the sciences, with the arts, with music. I actually liked everything. Even today, I like doing many things. I like reading fiction and nonfiction. I often uh, play uh, chamber music with certain musicians. Well, I'm embarrassed to say it, maybe because I'm old. I like bird watching. I think if you diverse your interests, that can feed back into your scientific work. It sort of enhances creativity. My journey in the health sciences field has been quite diverse because I spent so much time learning and training. It was such a long journey that I remember my mother saying once, when are you gonna be a real doctor? I came to St. Michael's Hospital after finishing my uh, training in infectious diseases, and then I went to do research with Dr. Anthony Fauci at the uh, National Institutes of Health. That was in the early 90s, and we were in the middle of the uh, AIDS epidemic. Working for Dr. Anthony Fauci, he really gave me the tools to try to figure out how to make the immune system fight HIV back. The nice thing about being a researcher is that you travel all around the world and you can get involved with projects um, globally. The project that we're working on is we're trying to improve the current state of the COVID-19 vaccines. 
It's very similar to the early days of the HIV epidemic where we didn't know how did HIV destroy the immune system, what part of the immune system can control this virus. There were so many unknowns. I guess what I like most about the job is to know that, that the patients are, your, are the best teachers. They're actually teaching you how the immune system works. Please welcome to the stage Renaissance man and bird watcher, Dr. Mario Ostrowski. Good evening. So we see images like this daily, people dying alone in hospitals with COVID-19 infection, and we're approaching 1 million deaths globally. So how are we gonna stop this pandemic? The only way to stop this virus is to create something called herd immunity. Now what herd immunity is, is to create a population of people that have antibodies and immunity against the COVID-19 virus, and they will create a firewall against people that are susceptible, protecting them. The general feeling is that you need about 70% of the population to be immune to COVID-19 to create herd immunity and to end the pandemic. Now, we know that New York City had a devastating epidemic where one in 500 New Yorkers died of COVID-19. And after that, only 20% of New Yorkers are antibodies to um, COVID-19. Thus, New York City has not reached herd immunity. 1% of Canadians only have antibodies to COVID-19. So if we just let nature take its course, over 2 million Americans and over a quarter million of Canadians would have to die before we reach herd immunity. So the other way to create herd immunity is with a vaccine. It's safe and, and it's fast. Now there are about 30 different vaccines now currently undergoing clinical trials. None of them in Canada, I should say. And I'm going to explain to you with simple diagrams how the current vaccines against COVID-19 work. What you see here is a B cell, which is an immune cell. And what you see here is the COVID-19 virus. Now the current COVID-19 vaccines actually stimulate the B cells to make antibodies. And then the antibodies bind to the virus and neutralize the virus in its tracks, preventing virus entry. That's a great way for a vaccine to work. But there are still problems that may not be ideal for this virus. And this is because what we're finding is that work has shown that only 50% of people with the current vaccine um, produce neutralizing antibodies. There are other better vaccines, but you have to give two shots one month apart. We're also finding that people with the infection are losing their antibodies after the infection within two months. And we think that if you get vaccinated, you might lose your antibodies as well. So the antibodies are losing, protection is disappearing after a few months. That would mean that we may have to vaccinate many times. In addition, if a vaccine is not manufactured in Canada, there's no guarantee we're gonna have speedy access to the vaccine here in Canada. So our strategy is different. The current vaccines that are in trials are just using the virus genetic material. We wanna create a vaccine that is designed where we learn from people who survived COVID-19 infection. They're called COVID-19 survivors. And picture to the left here is John. He uh, de developed a severe COVID-19 pneumonia in March. And when he recovered, we invited him to come to St. Michael's Hospital and he got hooked up to this machine. And this machine is taking billions of his immune cells so that we can study and figure out how his immune system got rid of the virus. This is the first time this has ever been done in the world and it was done at St. Michael's Hospital. We're going to use this information to make better COVID-19 vaccines. Our strategy will be to use a vaccine that also stimulates another immune cell called the T cell. Here in this diagram is a T cell. And what T cells do is they help B cells make better and longer lasting antibodies. T cells also can directly kill virus infected cells. And in this time lapse video, you can see there's a T cell right there in the arrow and it's rapidly looking for a virus infected cell and it can quickly find it and kill it. And the infected cell is turning green, meaning it's dying. So T cells can rapidly remove virus infected cells. So we think that by studying the immune system of survivors, we can develop a T cell vaccine that can be more effective than current vaccines. So, and I think we're confident we can do it because the survivors will give us the information. So the impact of the award will allow us to help build an effective vaccine that stimulates both T cells and antibodies. We are currently working with a Canadian vaccine company for preclinical development of this vaccine. If we are successful, we should start uh, vaccine trials in volunteers at the end of this year, and we should be able to have doses of vaccine available in mid of 2021. So Canadians deserve fast access to a vaccine made in Canada because COVID-19 is not going away. We, we have the second wave uh, coming upon us. Thank you. Thank you.
I loved your um, drawings, by the way. Oh, they, they were they were very you. simple to follow. Um, I have a I have a question about this because combining the vaccine with T cells, uh, essentially, does that create a vaccine that will last longer and also be stronger? Is that that's our, that's, our, that's our idea, that's is goal. that the problem is that the antibodies start decaying. And we think the reason why the antibodies don't decay is that the vaccine isn't harnessing these T cells to help the B cells. And there's gonna be an added benefit is that the T cells can also kill the virus if, they, if you get exposed to it. So, so this vaccine will be the first in the world that's gonna stimulate both the antibody and the T cell. That's right. Okay, so it's kind of like a killer combo uh, exactly. cocktail that year. All exactly. Right. You have all these major companies spending gazillion dollars on trying to develop a vaccine. How do you compete with them in terms of getting to market? So the, 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 the major companies, they made their vaccine based on the sequence of the virus that was produced by China very early in February. And they just looked at the sequence and they just went through, just made the vaccine. Now that we're learning more about the immune response to the virus, we realize that we may have, there's, that, that we may have to make the vaccine a little bit more nuanced than just make antibodies. And so even though these companies are producing a vaccine, and we don't know whether it's gonna work, it, it may or may not, we are, we are systematically trying to improve what these other companies haven't done yet. So I think it's important to keep working on this because we don't, we still haven't gotten rid of this virus. It's great, it's great yeah. work. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so Thanks much. So much. Great presentation. Yeah. Here's a team that wants to make COVID-19 survivors breathe more easily. Take a look. My name is Dr. Darren Yoon. I'm uh, one of the nephrologists and clinician scientists at St. Michael's Hospital. I'm Dr. Kieran McIntyre. I'm a respirologist here at St. Michael's Hospital. When I was growing up, uh, I thought I wanted to be a scientist. I realized when I, I wanted to become a physician in undergraduate studies at the university, I started to realize that the stuff that I learned in the lab, I couldn't necessarily do to help people. Uh, and I could see how I would do that in medicine. I think I had some influential people in my life that were also physicians. My father was a physician, and so that was probably one of the main reasons why I wanted to do this. We both have young kids at home, and I think um, kids provide some sense of reality. Like you come home from a long day at work and you realize that there's so much more to life. After day of work, I enjoy spending time with my family, my children, but I do also like to exercise, and so I, I, I tend to cycle. I think we met during training. Yeah, I think we were set up by friends. <laughs> yeah. St. Mike's, I think, is a special place. It has a small town or small hospital feel. I can pick up the phone and I can speak with Kieran. And that I think is what actually led to the project that we're doing. Although Darren and I have known each other for a long time, this is actually the first time we are teaming up together to work on a project for patient care. COVID virus causes damage to the lungs that often will get better. But over time, that damage could potentially lead to scarring and scarring could be potentially irreversible. We were sharing some, some interesting cases and then we said, there's gonna be more of this. And we were only beginning to see the tip of the iceberg. As a doctor, when you're seeing people and they're sick and making them better and seeing them walk out of the hospital, that's, that's really the greatest success that anyone can say they have in healthcare. Darren and I were talking about this and I think having had children, having had a career, my parents really are more incredible than I think I ever knew. And my parents are now older and are at risk of getting COVID. So when I think about what it is that I do, I'm gonna look after my parents and I'm gonna look after your parents and I'm gonna look after Darren's parents. Welcome longtime colleagues and friends and their first major collaboration, Drs. Darren Yoon and Kieran McIntyre. Okay, so COVID-19 has hit the world like a tsunami. Uh, and so far, what we've seen is the first wave of infections. But in a tsunami, it's actually not the first wave that causes the most damage. It's actually the flooding that occurs after. And for COVID, that flooding is going to be the long-term damage that COVID will cause. As a lung doctor at the front lines, I've seen this damage firsthand. I want to introduce you to one of our patients, Betty. So Betty came to my clinic after having COVID in April when she didn't require admission to hospital, but she was still sick. She was still short of breath and still coughing. So when I saw her, I arranged a CAT scan or a CT scan of her lungs. And I'll show you what a picture of healthy lungs would look like. And you can see that they're black, full of air. But a picture of what Betty's lungs would look like, we're not gonna show Betty's lungs because of confidentiality, is that they're scarred and you can see the white scarring and it's very hard to breathe when your lungs are full of scar like this. So we knew we had a problem. 
So what scares me though is that Betty is just the tip of the iceberg. Around the world, more than 20 million people have been diagnosed with COVID-19 already. And since we aren't testing everyone, the true number of infections may be up to 10 times higher, or 200 million people. Studies suggest that 40% of those people can develop long-term breathing problems. So if you do the math, that's 80 million people already today who may be developing long-term breathing problems. People may not be able to go back to work, take care of their kids, just because they can't catch their breath. And that's terrifying for me. But not to worry, that's why Darren and I are here. So together we've joined forces to form the first of its kind COVID lung clinic here at St. Michael's Hospital. We realized when we did this that we had two problems right away. The first was how to actually screen patients for COVID lung scarring. And that requires patients coming, like Betty, to the clinic. Then they have to come back a second time for a CAT scan or a CT scan. And then they have to come back a third time to see me in the clinic and go over the results. Now that's three separate visits in the middle of a pandemic and that's just too difficult and it's gonna make waiting time for other patients. So that was the first problem. The second problem, even when I identify a patient with scarring from COVID, there's nothing I can do. There are no available treatments for our patients, which is why Darren and I have teamed up. So I wanted to do things that are very exciting. So this has been the revolution in medicine of the lungs. This is ultrasound, which we can do in the clinic in real time, and patients can have an assessment of their lungs without radiation. And we know right away that they do or do not have any lung damage. And then I can decide by screening who does and does not need a CAT scan so that this valuable resource is used appropriately. So what about people like Betty though, when Kieran actually does find that they have lung scarring? How can we help them if we don't actually have effective treatments like Kieran said, and that's where I come in. So for the last seven years, I've been working in the lab on new anti-scarring treatments. So last year, we had made a breakthrough. We discovered this drug X uh, that we showed could reduce kidney scarring. And so we followed that up with some early studies in the lung that happened just before COVID hit that suggested that COVID might also work for the lung. But then COVID hit. So when Kieran talked to me about Betty, I realized that we had a potential new treatment for this flood of patients that were likely coming. All we needed to do was some final preclinical studies to confirm our findings in the lung. And then in one year's time, we could start the first in the world clinical trial right here at St. Mike's. The problem is we just didn't have those funds to finish those important clinical studies. And so with your support, we can do two things. One, we can purchase more handheld point of care ultrasounds like this one, where we can deliver real time information to our patients without having to have a CAT scan. And meanwhile, I'll be finishing those final preclinical studies of that drug X for lung scarring, so that in one year's time, if Kieran identifies a patient with lung scarring, he can send them to me right away for immediate enrollment in early clinical trials. So your support will help our two solutions come to reality for our patients at St. Michael's Hospital. But let's not forget about Betty. She could be your mother, sister, or wife. Even if we stopped infections magically today, we probably have in Canada alone almost 600,000 cases of COVID-19, true, known and unknown. That could fill the Rogers Centre more than 10 times over. But at St. Mike's, we're ready. Uh, with your support, Kieran and I will be there for people like Betty when they need us the most. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. And the financing that you're asking for today, is it to get more of these devices? Is it going to be split between getting more of these devices and also working on the drug? Like, how do you plan on splitting and We're that? ready to go with these devices right now. So I'm, we're already using them in the clinic, uh, but getting more of these devices is exactly what we're asking for. Do you need a drug partner to bring this forward? Or like, you can get through phase one through this capital of St. Mike's, but like, what's the, yeah, what's the next stage? It was a great question. So obviously taking a drug to market uh, takes time and also money. Yeah. So we uh, paired up with a number of pharmaceutical companies already who are ready to take this forward in, in clinical trials. The 150,000 will let us get to that stage and then we'll be taken over by uh, larger companies. So what we're really doing is investing and getting it to that last little phase and then seeing if this can be effective for COVID. Hopefully, yes. Yeah, that last little step to push us over the finish line. And remember, there are no other treatments at this present time that can do this. It's great work. It's great work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank yeah, you. Great presentation. And the time has come, judges and jury, to cast your vote on the last three teams. And audience, the voting opens at 8 p.m. for the People's Choice Award. Let's listen in as the judges deliberate. Anything that you'd like to share about your thoughts, your dreams, your hopes, your impressions? Just fantastic, right? Like, we've got to fund them all. We've we got to, to find a way to fund them all. What do you think, Vinay? What is what's this uh, night been like for you? Oh, it's been amazing. You know, I've just, uh, I mean, I've I've learned so much. Um, you know, just to meet our real life superheroes and and just yeah. to be in their presence has been amazing. To uh, and not only to know them as professionals, but to know them as people. Totally. I mean, these are really special stories that people have been able to share, and it's been great to get a peek. Um, into their home lives and like the incredible work and just the incredible creativity of this work that we're uh, 
that we're seeing today. With life-changing research and $450,000 on the line, the stakes are always high here on Angel's Den. Now is the moment of truth. Who is taking home the Keenan COVID-19 Research Award and the Odette Innovative Health Award? Now here to present the Odette Innovative Health Award, please welcome Mark Odette. Good evening. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. The PNL Odette Charitable Foundation is honored to support these brilliant and inspiring scientists. And now the moment you've been waiting for. The winner of the Odette Innovative Health Award is... Don't Skip the Skin, Dr. Karen Cross. Congratulations. Thank you very much for the honor. Um, one thing that didn't come out of my presentation is that I lost my grandfather during COVID to a wound. So the technology itself, it'll help other people just like him. Here to present the Keenan COVID-19 Research Award, I'd like to bring out one of the driving forces behind Angel's Den, a member of the Keenan family and co-chair of Angel's Den, please welcome Gwen Harvey. A huge thank you to all our scientists for making our lives safer. We applaud your ingenuity and your perseverance. It's my honor to announce the winner. The winner of the Keenan COVID-19 award is Dr. Darren Young and Dr. Karen McIntyre for their long life after Calvary. Congratulations. Wow. wow. Fantastic. Wow. I'm speechless. I'm honored to accept this with my colleague, Darren. On behalf of our colleagues at St. Michael's, thank you. And thank you to the Angels Den for your support of the work that we do. Thank you very much. Congratulations. It's almost your turn to vote for the People's Choice Award. Do you agree with our judges and jurors, or do you have a different opinion? Which of these ideas do you like best? We'll keep the voting open for the next hour. To vote, click on the vote button on angelsden.ca or use any device to scan the QR code you see on screen. Make sure everyone casts their vote on their own device. Remember, it is one vote per device. Make sure you tune in tomorrow morning to Breakfast Television when we'll announce the People's Choice Award winner. We'll announce the winner on angelsdan.ca and on the Foundation's social media channels. Now, the work does not stop here. If you've been inspired by what you've seen, you can support these teams of hardworking scientists and their research by donating at angelsdan.ca. And as you've seen tonight, every little bit counts. Please cast your vote now. I'm gonna do the same. And on behalf of myself, Maureen Holloway, our judges, jurors, and all the people here at Angel's Den and at St. Michael's Hospital, it has been a true pleasure to be a part of history. Thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs>